There we go. Great. So uh, just to add to the welcomes, we're delighted to have you here in Raleigh, and I'm delighted that I have the uh, coveted after lunch uh, session, and it's a beautiful day outside, so I'm delighted that, uh, that you've come inside to hear this as well. We may have time for a few questions at the end, so please be thinking about those. This is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour of where we are with open source, uh, talk a little bit about how we run our billion-dollar-plus business that uh, Todd alluded to on open source technology, and um, give you my opinions, perhaps, about where we're going and what's going to happen next. Uh, for those of you that don't know Red Hat, we are a uh, $1.3 billion company in our uh, revenue in our last fiscal year. We have about 6,000 associates around the globe. Raleigh, our headquarters uh, building, Red Hat Tower, is about two blocks east of here. It's the one with the big red sign on the top. And we're very proud of that. We moved in in July, and uh, it's been a, a terrific move. Our facilities team, we call them Global Workplace Solutions, did a terrific job. Very productive, very tech-oriented, you know, the bright colors, the foosball tables, and so on. And so it's, uh, it's been a great move, and I think has made all of us uh, more productive. But we're really about collaboration, community, and the business of open source. I won't talk about our business model. We don't have time to go into that in any great depth, but uh, we don't make money by selling free software, as I'm sure many of you know, but rather we provide support and services for folks that choose to use open source software to run their government, uh, business, or other enterprise. Um, let me just go uh, a little bit of context setting and talk a little bit about where I see the world today and how Red Hat, and specifically Red Hat IT as well, fit in that, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about where we're going. So, so first, um, you know, open source is really driving the technology trends, I think, that are driving business innovation. There are some other factors as well, uh, but uh, from a standpoint of big data and the idea of monitoring, uh, for good or for bad, our online behavior, understanding what uh, capabilities would exist where I can better drill for oil, for example, or understanding what consumer preferences are so I can target my products and advertise directly to those individuals rather than wasting resources uh, targeting folks that aren't interested are all examples, I think, of big data that are really enabled by tools like Hadoop and other products. And we wouldn't be having the discussions about big data that we're having. We wouldn't see some of the early successes that are starting to appear if we didn't have open source technology that's enabled folks to, importantly, start with inexpensive hardware and software and share it with others to learn quickly rather than waiting for proprietary vendors to develop solutions that would not be accessible to probably as broad a community. The second thing, and, and this isn't all open source, but I think open source plays a key role here, is the, the notion of apps. It's really changed the way consumers think about technology, and a lot of these trends are being driven by consumer technology, interestingly enough, and consumer technology companies, if you will, like Google, Facebook, uh, Netflix, uh, Amazon, and others. Uh, that is quite different than the old days that some of us remember when uh, the technology was being driven by a large uh, uh, enterprise-focused uh, companies that were developing products specifically for those enterprises. So it's, it's interesting, and we'll talk about this, something we're trying to do is to play a little bit of catch-up since we have a classic IT infrastructure and we're really trying to get to a cloud infrastructure. But the notion of apps and the ability to back end those with largely open source based clouds that we'll talk about in a moment, very much changing the dynamics of computing broadly and making it much more accessible and consumerizing it. Mobile completely different experience than 5, 10, 15 years ago. I, I was thinking, I remember being in D.C. and trying to pull down, you know, the weather radar on one of the early uh, uh, mobile data devices, and it took 20 minutes to see uh, what the radar was. Now, of course, you can, from your uh, phone, get just about any information instantaneously in most major metro areas, and they truly are handheld computers. But you can do that on a plane. Uh, you can do that in increasingly remote areas, and I think... We are just at the very beginning of being able to see how mobile is going to change all of our lives. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm, I actually turn off my phone here so it doesn't interfere with the microphone, but that's about the only time that I'm not in touch, um, both for people to reach out to me as well as for me to gather information on what I'm interested in, what's happening in Red Hat IT, what's happening in the world. And then this notion of cloud computing, I think, is... 
uh, a paradigm shift of the same magnitude as when we went from mainframes to minis, for those of you that remember back in the day, minis to micros, micros to land-based and so on. This is a different way of computing, which is not to say that we won't have mainframe computers 10 years from now, but I think increasingly greenfield applications and new applications that we're just starting to conceive of are enabled by this idea of utility computing delivered by the cloud from a variety of vendors. And of course, we're at the peak of the hype cycle now in many ways. Every, every, every email I get offering IT services mentions its cloud capability, so I'm sure you see some of the same things. But that said, I do think we're see, uh, starting to realize the promise of the, back in the 1960s when we had time-sharing dial-up services that were going to be utility computers. We're actually starting to see that now with the availability of renting virtual machines on demand, renting storage on demand, and so on. And it changes us for those, from a long-term capital investment type model to a on-demand, what problem do I need to solve right now model. I think that's healthy. Second bit, um, you know, Red Hat. I won't talk a lot about Red Hat today. I'll touch on a couple of community initiatives in a little, little bit, but things you need to know about Red Hat are we really are about the community. I've got some examples of products on the right here, but from a Red Hat perspective, we are very much, whether we initiate the concept or whether we acquire a technology, we are very much about community and ensuring that there's a successful community built around those technologies rather than building them ourselves or even controlling them ourselves. So Fedora and other projects that hopefully you're familiar with are really self-governed entities and we choose the appropriate bits out of that to make test, uh, certify, make sure they're enterprise ready and support them. That's what we do for a living. But it really is about the community, not about Red Hat control of those entities. And I think that's different and refreshing compared to some other open source or purportedly open source initiatives uh, that I've observed. Second thing is it's really internally about our culture. We work very hard to provide a culture. People are committed to this ideal, but they're also committed to a collaborative approach to solving problems and uh, ensuring that the best ideas win. So those two things, perhaps a little unique for us, but um, it really define the way Red Hat ticks. And I would add a, a third bit, which is we pride ourselves greatly on our ability to support our customers, and we work on that very hard, and I think that's one of the things that enables us to differentiate our solutions from those of our competitors. So brief introduction to Red Hat. I'll come back a little bit and talk about some community projects shortly, but, but um, it is a unique place in my experience, having worked at some other large organizations in terms of how we think about the world and how we default to open. Um, Red Hat IT. So I'm very proud of the progress that Red Hat IT has been able to achieve over the last six, six plus years that I've been with the organization. We were struggling to survive uh, six years ago and just keep the doors open. We've been able to progressively go through a series of improvements where we could could actually the first uh, first month and a half I was on the job we had a two day outage of our ERP system and we couldn't process orders and we had this very small bandwidth line back from our data center in Arizona and uh, they kept telling me you know we're copying the stuff back we got a backup copy and I'm like why don't we get on a plane and just put it on media and bring it home uh, but uh, we ultimately got through that and since that time we've been able to. Uh, improve dramatically to deliver projects reliably, to be a trusted partner of our business, and increasingly we're working to lead our business in some innovation areas like data, like mobility, like cloud, uh, like collaboration. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples because I think these are relevant in terms of how we approach the world. We run all of our infrastructure uh, with the uh, a exception of a few Windows uh, systems that we use to support the Windows laptops in the organization. We don't have very many, but we need some of them for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's all Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, virtualized on Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. Our enterprise service bus is JBoss. We're in the process of upgrading to JBoss 6. We'll talk about where that's going and some new products uh, in a little bit. Uh, our laptops are 85% Linux laptops. Uh, we have um, an open source uh, Zimbra email calendaring and contact solution. We use open source for blogging, for our intranet, uh, and for two projects I'm going to talk about uh, right now. Um, 
The first was a, about a year and a half ago, we had a legacy vendors uh, two-factor authentication hardware tokens that we had deployed uh, a number of years ago. And we knew we were facing the end of life for those tokens, and we wanted to replace them with an open source solution. So, so we looked around, we looked at the, vendors, the existing vendor solution, we looked at some proprietary solutions, and we identified a solution, several, that seemed to be suitable. And we had this vision of bring your own token, meaning rather than passing out hardware tokens to all of our folks, as we had done in the past, we wanted to offer that option for the non-technical folks and the folks who wanted it to just work. But we also wanted to essentially let uh, an associate choose any standards compliant uh, open source uh, token generator. We'd give them the shared secret, and they'd be able to use that to access our systems. Very successful program. We did, following the collaboration model I described, we got a group of individuals from across the organization involved. We tested a variety of products. We got their feedback on the user interface. We picked a product called LinOTP to do the administration piece. We wrote some code on the front end to do provisioning and so on. We ordered the tokens. It turns out the first batch was bad. That was a bit of a black eye for us, but we got, we, we got them uh, replaced. We did uh, walk-up tables in the cafeterias and so on for people to be able to turn in their old one and get a new one. We set up uh, what I thought the team did a brilliant job was you sign on to the, the authenticate yourself to the screen, you uh, load Google Authenticator on your uh, iPhone or Android device, and you take a picture of a QR code to get the shared secret so that now uh, we've got a shared secret. You can generate the, uh, the token codes on an ongoing basis. And some folks have chosen uh, independently to use technologies like YubiKeys, if you're familiar with those. And uh, so we have an ongoing sort of internal sign-up where people are spending their own money, by the way, to buy YubiKeys uh, and provision those to enable access to our systems. But Bring Your Own Token has been an extremely successful program for us. We continuously get great feedback from the audience. People get to choose whatever works best for them, whether it's the Jamalto hard token that we assign to them if they want it, whether it's Google Authenticator on the phone. Some folks have uh, Java-based uh, token generators that they're using, and, and they choose what fits their work pattern. We know it's them because uh, we've got a shared secret, and that's worked extremely well for us and very robust in production. So we're very proud of that. Another example of the way we think about solving problems with open source, <coughs> excuse me, is um, our phone system. Um, similar situation, legacy vendor VOIP phone system coming up against a renewal of both the hardware and software licenses, expensive, uh, inflexible, confusing licensing, and so on. So we felt that we needed an alternative. Um, and uh, my telephony team a couple of years ago started looking at Asterisk uh, and some other solutions. We actually decided on a platform called OpenUC, SIP compliant, XMPP messaging, presence for those of you uh, that know uh, the vernacular, uh, video capability, and so on. And we started with a pilot where we went to our remote users and said, you know, we'd like to test this. You're working at home. About 20 or 25% of our workforce work from remote locations. Would you be willing to work with us in a collaborative fashion? We got lots of feedback. We often do. We got lots of technical opinions in the organization. But a big success, and we have quickly determined that we needed to actually ship them a hardware phone that would sign on to our registration utility and, and provision itself and uh, wake up on the internal network rather than solely relying on uh, some open source platforms like Twinkle, Akiga, and some of the others that some of you may be familiar with. So we added that step, the ability to ship uh, an open source, uh, or excuse me, a, a standards compliant phone. By the way, the first vendor we chose didn't actually meet our needs from a reliability standpoint, so we picked a different vendor. We iterated our th way through the project. We started to deploy sites. Uh, we got some more feedback. It turns out that administrative assistants have a different set of use cases than some of our remote workers, and we learned that uh, in some cases the hard way. But as we worked our way through the problem, uh, we're now 75% deployed. All of our major locations, except Red Hat Tower, which we start in about two weeks. I just uh, approved the order for the phones uh, a couple of days ago. And we're very excited because we've enabled, again, people to choose their tool. We give them help, help articles that explain how to connect a non-standard or standards compliant but not supported phone. And at the same time, we ship a phone to the folks that just want it to work. Interestingly enough, in our Czech Republic location, about 
30% of the folks said, you know, I don't really need a hard phone anymore. If you give me a work number, I can, using the utility, dynamically route it to my mobile device or allow it to take voice messages or, you know, it's just a, it's like an email alias, right? It's just another number. It doesn't have to actually be connected to a physical device. So uh, our early returns here are about 10% in headquarters. They have a little uh, different set of use cases. But again, the fact that we think we're going to be able to save considerable money, certainly on the hardware implementation, on the software, it's just it's open source, so we pay support fee to uh, eZeus, but uh, not big license fees, and uh, the ability to actually not deploy hard phones in many cases in our offices is going to be a big win for us. Uh, as part of that project, we're actually subsidizing a firm to uh, standardize and package uh, Lin Phone, which is an open source uh, phone utility that we're going to deploy on all five of our key platforms, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, um, iOS, and Android, so that folks will be able to get a consistent experience and, again, save us a lot of money. All of these things are, I think, examples of the trend toward commoditization and, to a degree, consumerization in IT. The offerings that I deliver need to be competitive with Google Plus Hangouts, need to be competitive with Skype and uh, FaceTime. And in fact, they need to embrace those because the reality is that's what our associates are using. That's certainly what our customers are using. And so we need to have solutions that encompass those and bring them together. So we prefer, we certainly have some proprietary solutions. We prefer open source and we prefer commodity solutions. And of course, we highly prefer Red Hat solutions in our infrastructure. But that enables us to drive innovation. So. Um, in my mind, innovation is just doing new things better. And for us as a company to become more data-driven, to lead the charge to cloud, uh, we're probably 45 or 50% cloud-based now coming off of a classic sort of data center-like infrastructure. I'm pushing the team to get to 70% cloud-based uh, over the course of the next two years. We'll talk a little bit about what that means when we get to OpenShift and OpenStack. But we really want to be innovation leaders for the company. We're pushing mobile apps now. We've got a conference room scheduling app for the tower where folks can uh, walk up to a conference room and schedule it on their mobile device that uh, we're getting ready to deploy a beta. Uh, so we really think that driving our apps outside the firewall and the interfaces to mobile devices means they're accessible to our associates, and that enables us to drive this innovation. So um, that's a little bit about where we are. I'm going to uh, take a pause here. We'll play a video and let you see uh, how we got here over the last 20 years. Because hard as it may uh, be to believe, Red Hat is actually 20 years old this year. So let's take a look at the video, and then we'll come back and talk about where we're going. What happens when you share an idea? Well. It can change our understanding, enlighten our minds, inspire innovation, even correct our thinking. And ideas that are shared have a way of illuminating the things around us, unleashing creativity, and moving us all. A single idea shared in the open can change everything. When Linus Torvald sent out his message, his timing was perfect. Mark working out of his spare bedroom was doing a Linux distribution, which he named after his missing grandfather's lacrosse cap. If you wanted something, you built it. And then if you wanted something really special, you shared it. We're an open source company, and we're not going to walk away from that just to make money. We believe that we're on the vanguard of a new revolution. So many opportunities. We have proven the power of participation in software, knowledge building upon knowledge can be valuable. You see, at Red Hat, we know we are better as a community. And because of that, so much more will be discovered. So much more will be learned. So much more will be accomplished. All because of you. I'm very proud. It's a great story, and I hope you recognize some of the voices there of the leaders of uh, Red Hat over the years and uh, some of the key contributors to our success, but more importantly to open source in general. Uh, let me talk uh, a little bit about where we're going. So first of all, how is IT changing? Well, these are times of opportunity and, uh, and scary times as well for IT organizations because the things that 
we traditionally have been good at, uh, which is running production applications and that we're unique in the enterprise and being able to do, um, guess what? That's becoming a commodity, as we were talking a, a little while ago. So you can buy data center services, virtual machines, whatever you need, and increasingly software as a service applications, which was another competency that was unique to IT organizations, the ability to build applications. Now you can uh, go to an internet delivered software as a service application and as a business person very quickly provide that service. So um, the traditional IT model of you run the uh, data center, 70% of your budget, you develop applications, 30% of your budget, and you take a budget cut every year because the business can't afford that much, um, that's actually changing pretty dramatically. There will clearly be organizations, just like mainframes, as I mentioned, 10 years from now, there will clearly be IT organizations with an adoption curve that still their business or their leadership or their vision takes them to that model in the future. Uh, just as there are IT organizations that today are thinking about where we're going and how they become business leaders rather than simply technology leaders, and obviously a lot in the middle. But I think the opportunity here is to change the nature of the engagement between business and IT. IT organizations still new, need to do the things I described uh, in an excellent fashion. They still need to be able to deliver applications, run production, but they need to increasingly innovate. And the way they're going to do that largely is through cloud-based solutions. Obviously, legacy technologies, but like every generation of technology, the cloud gives some agility capabilities, some flexibility capabilities, and importantly, speed to market. Um, you know, my, my DevOps team is, is highly engaged with cloud right now uh, because they think that it is where we're going and it's going to enable us to deliver solutions faster to our internal and external customers. So. Let me talk briefly about two community-powered innovation programs that Red Hat is sponsoring, participating in, and developing into products. Uh, the first is OpenShift. Uh, this is the platform that uh, our platform is a service offering. Uh, there's a, um, Origin is the upstream project. Online is the free and uh, fee solution that you can buy uh, that runs on Amazon Web Services. And Enterprise is the solution that runs in your data center as a private cloud offering. Um, we've got a bit of a hybrid in Red Hat IT. We've deployed the enterprise solution, which gives us more flexibility and resource allocation and so on, on AWS for speed to market. Um, we ran a pilot a couple of months ago. We got a couple of hundred applications and uh, associates sign up. We think this is going to be transformative in terms of delivering not only you know, laptop-style computing or even server-style computing, but network-style computing with access to the internet to all of our associates, and we're really looking forward to the ideas that that's going to drive for our organization. The pilot was so successful, that we, or excuse me, the proof of concept was so successful, we skipped the pilot stage and we went directly to production. This morning I announced to the organization that we're actually opening, it was running inside our firewalls, we're actually opening it up now and allowing folks to uh, develop and deliver applications that are available on the internet uh, as well using that platform. My Enterprise Service Bus team using the Switchyard technology, a JBoss project, uh, when we did the uh, Fuse acquisition. Uh, next generation Enterprise Service Bus for us looks like it's going to be running on OpenShift using the Switchyard technology and partitioned or present in our data center and in probably two cloud providers as well. So we're excited about that. And as I say, we're pushing hard to get to cloud. Um, another community project that we and and community effort uh, and some big names in this community is OpenStack. We see this as our data center architecture of the future. We see this as our infrastructure as a service uh, offering of the future, both internally and externally. And we believe we're going to be migrating to this uh, as a default architecture for our internally. The apps that we develop that we choose to continue to deploy internally. It's going to be actually a decreasing set if, you, if we get to our 70%. But I also think our application vendors that are delivering the on-premises applications we use today will migrate to this technology over time as well. Uh, and so as a consequence, we are very positive about OpenStack and see it not only as an architecture but as an implementation. And uh, you avoid lock-in. You get to pick and choose what's best for you. You get to choose your vendor partners. Uh, but a great place to go in terms of taking advantage of this uh, new emerging cloud capability. 
let me just summarize by um, saying, you know, what, what is the value here and, and what can you expect to get? Certainly our experience is as we continue to exploit open source solutions in Red Hat and in Red Hat IT, speed to market. For us, cost is essential, right? We are still a relatively small company, but being able to get things out the door quickly is vital. And so the, the ability for us to deliver solutions even faster and our ability to do this DevOps uh, work on open source solutions uh, is key to our future success. We're putting a lot, a lot of good people and a, a lot of resources on that. Flexibility. I touched, touched on this earlier, the ability to try three or four different things, figure out the one that works and ride that, rather than spending a lot of negotiating, a lot of time up front, the ability to start fast, uh, decide what's going to work and then move ahead has been a big win for us. And the fact that so many of these solutions being standards based, they're compatible with our existing infrastructure, enable us to be innovation leaders for Red Hat and beyond, uh, we see that as vital as well. So we're working, um, hard on that, and uh, we certainly, as running a large business, Todd alluded to this, running a large business on open source technology has been a tremendous success story for us. I just want to make uh, one other mention um, before we get into the Q&A, so please, uh, if you have a question or two, we should have a little bit of time for that. Um, uh, Jason Hibbets is in the audience, I think, I can't see with the lights now, but was up uh, here on my left. Uh, has got a presentation tomorrow. You are here, here being Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, Raleigh is working to become an open source city. I think, you know, one thing we didn't have time to talk about today, and, and I don't want to uh, spoil, uh, Jason knows much more about it than I do, but, you know, citizen empowerment, sharing civic data, making it available to folks so you can figure out where the next bus is, for example, all those things I think are tremendous opportunities based on this idea of community and open source. Jason's going to be talking a lot more about that in a session late tomorrow morning. I would encourage you to attend. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I will take a question or two here. Um, if you want to know more about Red Hat, there's the URL. I encourage you to follow me on Twitter. I tweet on topics of interest about technology, open source, and some things I just like to tweet about as well, like uh, spacecraft on Mars and so on. Uh, but uh, I encourage you to follow me. And I also encourage you to uh, like uh, Red Hat on Facebook and uh, start planning, uh, we are, uh, April 14th of next year in San Francisco as the next Red Hat Summit when we bring the community together uh, to share ideas. So with that, uh, I will take a couple of questions. And I don't think we've got a microphone, so I'll repeat it. Uh, if somebody wants to uh, wave your hand or stand up and uh, I'll recognize you. Nobody. Okay, okay, okay we got one right here in the front, please. So I think a driver, uh, the question was uh, open source and education. And I think there are some positive things happening, which is, you know, we're starting to see STEM initiatives around the country, certainly a real focus in North Carolina. Um, we're starting to see initiatives like Girls Who Code and Code for America and other initiatives that are really focusing folks on how important it is uh, engineering and software engineering uh, are as careers. I do think that the default in a lot of the schools that I see, both because the educators don't come out of technical careers to a large degree, and because there is a bit of a vocational aspect about public education as well, that you know you got to learn Word, you got to learn uh, PowerPoint, you got to learn Excel, and that's where people start by default, uh, and they may learn a programming language. Um, probably, hopefully, in an open source environment over time, but tend to default to Windows because that's what the school, or maybe Apple because that's what the school has. I do think as the STEM initiatives start to mature and grow fruit, as open source becomes more prominent in the vernacular, you know, it's amazing how many people I talk to at parties and so on who, who have never, surprises me, never heard of Red Hat, don't know anything about the Linux operating system. How can that be? It's in your car. It's in the plane you just flew in on. But, you know, it's, real, it's in your phone. But um, it's really, you know, it, it's a different world in some cases. And so I think as, as uh, open source becomes more prominent in the public eye, as STEM initiatives take hold, and as folks start to think about learning software skills 
uh, code.org, another example, as a useful life skill to a greater degree, that we will see open source become more prominent because people, uh, other than just enthusiasts, will be downloading copies of Fedora and learning how to program in Java and uh, C++ and other technologies. So I think I am out of time. Um, I greatly appreciate your attention. And uh, again, uh, thanks for spending time with me this afternoon. <laughs>